All right, thank you, CX, and um, thanks also to Uncle Billy for that very educational and interesting welcome to country. Um, I'm going to talk. Whoops, already gone ahead there. Um, so we're going to talk about population genetics of corals today, and the motivation for that is uh, really about. Um, trying to better understand uh, corals and coral reefs so that we can better conserve them. And of course, because it's abacus, I'm going to have a bit of a genomic spin to that. And um, I'd also like to broadly acknowledge the Turrbal people as traditional custodians of Mianjin or Brisbane, and also um, pay my respects to their elders past and present, and um, extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people here today. So coral reefs are one of uh, nature's great wonders, and they're not just beautiful, they're also actually economically very important. They provide uh, income and coastal protection to millions of people around the world in tropical regions, but unfortunately they're under threat due to climate change, and the main reason for that is that when corals get hot, they bleach. And this white coral here is bleached. It's um, white because it's lost its algal endo endosymbionts, that it requires to survive. Now on the right, you can see a picture of a marine heat wave event. And one, the things I want you to notice about that is just how big an extent it covers. And so when these events occur, and they're occurring more frequently, they actually can bleach and kill corals on a massive scale. And they don't just occur in the Great Barrier Reef, they occur globally. So this is a massive problem. And the main hope that we have really for corals and coral reefs in the Anthropocene is that they might be able to adapt. And there's some hope for that because there's a lot of natural variation in heat tolerance of corals. And there's at least some evidence that this is under genetic control. So um, with this in mind, people are also trying to think of ways that we might be able to help corals to um, potentially adapt or also to help them if they go into decline. So conservation genetic interventions. To design these kinds of things, we actually need to understand how corals evolve naturally. So my research is really focused on understanding natural evolutionary processes in corals and also understanding the structure of genetic variation in corals. And I'm gonna give you two examples of that in my talk. Before I do that though, I would just like to make a bit of a case for using whole genome sequencing more when we're doing population genetic studies in biodiversity and conservation. We tend to be a bit budget constrained in this space, but it's important to remember that we spend a lot of money sometimes on field work, collecting samples. Sometimes people even brave crocs and sharks uh, to collect them. And it's also true that um, if we're collecting samples today, they might form a really irreplaceable historical record. So um, it's important to really treat those samples with the greatest of respect that we can. Now, a recent systematic review found that microsatellites remain still the most widely used marker in coral population genetics. Now, I don't want to be a terrible microsatellite basher, but um, you know, I do want to sort of um, try to encourage people to use um, the latest methods and explain why they're beneficial. So I'm going to adopt a bit of an analogy here and um, pretend that a coral genome can be viewed as a sort of image of a coral reef. And this is what microsatellites might look like. They're pretty good markers, but there's not very many of them. And there's a lot of white space, basically stuff that we don't know anything about. So if we want to look at selection or we want to look at demographic processes, these are not very good markers. RADSEQ and target capture sequencing is a fair bit better because it does give a genome-wide picture, but there's still a lot of missing picture. If we use shallow whole genome sequencing, we have a whole picture, but it's a bit blurry, and we also have some maybe unresolved structural variants in there as well. So what we really need to be aiming for is something that like this. So we have phased, genotyped whole genome sequencing, maybe with some long reads to resolve those structural variants. It's a high bar to aim for, um, but what I want to try and illustrate with my two examples is um, what the benefits of striving for that are. So the first example here is actually work that was done by um, former PhD student Jia Zhang, um, who worked with me, and also collaborator Zoe Richards. And 
what we were interested in were these amazing corals from the Kimberley region of Western Australia. These corals can survive being exposed at low tide for hours in the hot Kimberley sun. They also um, can handle fluctuations in water temperature up to seven degrees in a single day, um, and also really turbid waters as well. So arguably they shouldn't really be there at all. It's amazing that corals can survive, but they thrive. So they've clearly adapted to this environment. And we, what we're really interested in is trying to figure out um, how and what genes were involved. So of course we went and we sequenced some Kimberley corals. And also some lucky people got to go to these offshore atolls and sample from there. Now these are a kind of contrasting site. Uh, they have beautiful, pristine, crystal clear water all the time. The water temperature doesn't fluctuate all that much. In short, it's where you really expect to find corals. So here's our sort of contrast. And we did some sequencing, of course. And we aim for about 20x coverage because we figured that was about what we needed to accurately genotype at all the loci um, in all the individuals. And because we had that, we were then able to phase haplotypes with shape it for. I'll try and point out a couple of points where that was useful uh, as I go. So let's get back to our question. We want to actually be able to scan the genome and look for parts of the genome where we see signatures of strong selection in the Kimberley. And one way to do that is to look where this branch length here is longer than expected. And we can calculate that branch length with an allele frequency based measure called population branch statistic. And of course we can do classical kind of Manhattan plot like this. So here we've just made a big scan across the genome for this population branch statistic. And you can see a couple of big spikes, might be interesting, something worth looking at, but you need to just take a bit of a pause there because there's demographic processes like bottlenecks that could generate a similar signal. So we now needed to go on a bit of a journey to learn about the demographic processes that were going on in these corals. And we'll come back to this uh, after we've done that, see if we can set a significance threshold. So the first thing we did was just did some uh, PCA, and we could see that these samples actually clustered quite beautifully by location. And I was actually really surprised when I see, saw this because I've been working on the Great Barrier Reef, similar sized sampling area, similar species, and found absolutely no genetic structure at all. So I wanted to know, you know, what is it about Western Australia that makes us different? If you look at these images here, these are from Allen Coral Atlas, and the yellow shows you coral, the black is just non-coral sea habitat. And on the left, you can see Northwestern Australia, and the areas between, between our salu sites, we've got hundreds of kilometers where there's no reef at all. So for coral larvae to disperse between these is actually pretty unlikely, probably happens very rarely. Whereas on the Great Barrier Reef, it's incredibly connected. Anywhere from to anywhere else is connected by many other intervening reefs. So that explains the sort of spatial context. We also need to think about time. And importantly, we need to think about what was going on in the last ice age. The sea level was 120 meters below what it is today, which means that the coastline was way out here. And our sampling sites in the Kimberley were basically hills in the savannah, and there was absolutely no coral there, that's for sure. Um, and also the atolls themselves, they have coral on the top of them, but they have really steep sides. So 120 meters of sea level below would have not necessarily been very good habitat for corals there either. So, you know, where were the corals in the ice age? We don't really know exactly where they are, but we can outline two possibilities. One is that they shared a common refuge, in which case, if we look at the splitting time of these populations, they should all be about 20,000 years or younger. Alternatively, they might have independently survived multiple glacial cycles in their own particular refugia, in which case we should see that they split a much older time. So we use some demographic methods to do this, we use a few different methods, and I'm just gonna tell you about one of them. So this is a sequentially Markovian coalescent method. And basically what it does is divides up the genome into non-recombining chunks. And within each of those chunks, we estimate the time to most recent common ancestor of the haplotypes in that chunk. And that gives us a coalescent event. 
And then we can estimate effective population size through time because times in the past where we have a lot of coalescence events are times when the population size was um, quite small and vice versa. So we do this for our populations. Um, and here we have effective population size on a log scale on the y-axis and time on the x-axis. So actually it's sort of over on the right, that's the oldest time. So if you track from the right to the left, you'll see that these populations, they're all basically the same up to about 20,000 years ago. And then you start to see their population size trajectories diverge, which is also because they're diverging genetically as well. And they're becoming separated from one another. We also see at that same time, they're going through a bottleneck. So if we put the sea level type change onto that, you can see that this is around about the time when the sea level came up enough that the habitats that we now have corals in were inhabitable. So they, um, the sea level was high enough to make um, the tops of the atolls uh, inundated, et cetera. So basically what it looks like is that, they, yes, they did share a common glacial refuge. And because of the geographical context of WA, there was big areas that they had to disperse. And so it was probably a relatively small number of individuals that made it all the way. That creates a founder effect that we can see here as a bottleneck in our population size plot. So we have now a demographic model. And um, let's go back to this idea about the population branch statistics. So um, we have this model, it simulates neutral processes, no selection at all. We can simulate data under that assumption. And we also have our real data where we think there might be some selection going on. Calculate population branch statistic for both, put it into a kind of um, stacked histogram like this. And then if we, let's say we draw the line here as this is out, we call that a significant population branch statistic. Everything to the right of that, we're saying it's significant. In this case, you can see that there's still a lot of green. So those are false positives because they come from our simulated data. So that's probably too, um, too uh, relaxed. If we move our bar to the right, you can reduce the false positive rate. So if we take that to its conclusion, we can calculate an empirical false positive rate at any value, set a value so that it's acceptably low, come back to our Manhattan plot, and now we can set that value. And sure enough, we see that there's still plenty of interesting loci that we can look at to see if what those genes are and um, have a look at whether they're involved in adaptation. So we're gonna just have a look now at one of them and zoom in. So this is on one of the strongest signals. And here we also had some other statistics. So one's a haplotype based selection statistic, XPEHH, and our population branch statistic and Tajima's D. Everything points towards a strong selective sweep on this gene in the middle here. And this is a peroxynectin gene. And there's um, differential expression studies in corals that have shown that these genes um, are differentially expressed under heat stress. So we think this is a pretty interesting locus to look at um, as far as adaptation to these hot Kimberley conditions. I just wanna show you one more thing here to corroborate um, sort of the timing of selection here. So let's see if we can estimate you know, when selection occurred specifically at this locus. So here is um, the gene um, and we have all the variants, they're each shown with a dot. And the y-axis actually shows a date that we've assigned with a tool called GEVA to the original mutation that caused that variant. And it's, a, it's an estimate, it's not exactly right. But um, what you can see is that these dots are sort of spread out everywhere. You basically know pattern. But if we overlay allele frequency, you can see that all these old um, alleles are very, very high frequency. And if we draw a line, that's about where that sort of separates it. And what's happened here is that selection has come along at a certain point and it's swept everything to basically fixation. And then below that, we have new mutations that have happened after selection. So in the last 10 to 20,000 years ago, which fits our idea that this happened in conjunction with the glacial transition. And um, it gives us another way to sort of date that um, event. So we published this in MBE, and I think that it um, had a new perspective on how glacial cycles drive diversity in marine habitats, and also highlighted the role of these peroxynectins. We benefited a lot from having good quality data. 
Um, we could get more accurate demographic estimates and we could use more powerful techniques to estimate selection and pinpoint the real signals um, in, from, from a, lot of, a lot of noise. And we could also estimate timing of selection. And the thing I didn't show you was we'll even have a bit of a stab at what the um, causal allele might be. So I'm going to talk to you about a second study. This is newer work that Jia Zhang started and is now being um, done by Nadia Schneller as part of her MPhil. And this would be probably one of the first studies on structural variance in corals, as far as we know, basically is um, uncharted territory. We're really interested in chromosomal inversions. Um, and these are really interesting from a population genetics point of view. Here she shows um, three possible carrier types of an, an inversion. And the reason this is interesting from a population genetics point of view is that recombination in both the homo carrier types is unaffected, but in the um, heterocarrier type, there is actually blocked um, uh, crossing over in the inverted region. So this basically creates a barrier to gene flow between the inverted and the ancestral arrangements. What it also does is it creates signatures that we can detect these structural variants just using SNP data alone. So we went to an old data set of shallow whole genome sequencing from corals on the Great Barrier Reef, and we scanned a genome, another Manhattan plot, sorry, uh, for using a statistic that actually captures local genetic structure um, that might arise due to this blocked recombination. And we could see five really clear signatures there that pop out from the background. And um, if we zoom in on those, so in each one of them, we have a look, we can see a really strong signal of um, linkage disequilibrium there that matches what we expect. And this occurs for all five of them. And we did a bunch of other statistics basically to show that, yes, recombination is reduced at these loci. They're probably inversions. And in addition, we also think that they're probably under balancing selection. Now, from a conservation genetics point of view, what's interesting um, is that there's also greater mutational load at these loci. We use SNPF to look at SNPs within these inversions and their effect on protein coding genes. And what we found is that compared to the background genome, within the inversions, we found many more moderate and high effect SNPs. So these are SNPs that affect, um, make a strong effect on the amino acid um, as opposed to low, which would be uh, just um, say in an intron or something like that, right? And this could be both positive or negative for a conservation genetics point of view. Um, on the one hand, these are probably SNPs that actually have a high fitness effect. And if conditions change so that those become beneficial for some reason, um, they could facilitate local adaptation or clinal adaptation. On the other hand, um, there's a decent chance many of them are actually deleterious and possibly recessive. And if we actually go through a population bottleneck, possibly imposed by some sort of um, you know, uh, intervention even, such as um, propagation initiative or a selective breeding program, um, we might expose those deleterious alleles and experience a loss of fitness. So basically it's kind of complicated and we think there's a lot more that we need to know about what's going on and the effect of structural variance on um, mutational load in corals. And we want to really understand structural variance a lot better. And Nadia is going to be using long reads to improve our understanding of structural variance in corals, um, find out how old they are, really find all of them and not just the ones that are really abundant, um, and also disentangle more complicated cases. So I'd like to acknowledge um, students who've worked on these projects, so um, Jia and Nadia, and also Zoe Richards, collaborator on the Western Australian work. Um, great research group that I share with Jan Strugnell, um, Marine Omics Research Group at JCU, um, ARC for funding, uh, and uh, many other collaborators. And also um, traditional owners of sea country in Western Australia, the Badi Jawi, Mayala, Dumbi Manganadi, and in the Great Barrier Reef, Guganji, Manbara, Bandin, Banjin, Juru, and Wulgarukaba people. And we use their access their sea country to collect samples. And finally, a shameless plug, 
for a new project that we'll be starting next year. This is gonna be really cool. We're gonna to try to understand the basis of the specific relationship between symbiotic algae and corals. And we're gonna use single cell sequencing to do that and long read sequencing. And um, if you're interested in those projects, possible PhD or postdoc opportunities, watch for my announcements on the socials. There you go. Um, any questions on the floor? So you can realize we, we have a really big room here, so we have two um, mics um, stand. So if you have any questions, please um, feel free to come up and ask your question. We're not gonna pass the mics around. It's too, it's too big of a room. Any questions from the floor? If not, if I could start. <laughs> All right, so thank, thanks for, um, for your very you know, uh, informative talk. Um, some of the tools that you use, you know, to do all this population genetics, obviously is developed for model systems and, and whatnot. Um, mm. How much of tweaking or, or fine tuning you need to do to adapt for coral systems? Uh, I would say mostly um, trying to just satisfy the requirements of the tool, which is sometimes um, not, it's not possible. So that's why in a way you've got to get better sequencing data. So a lot of what I'm doing is trying to chase the right kind of data to be able to use the tool um, and also just knowing when the tool is applicable or not. I haven't done too much tweaking of the tool, but more just recognizing when it's beyond its 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 uh, limitations uh, or not. Yeah. Right. But but getting the data is challenging. It, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so is there, is, are there any new big batches of data coming out from the different calls? There are, well, there, there <laughs> you probably know more about that than me, CX, I don't know. All right, please. Yeah, thanks. Thank you for the amazing talk. I'm really interested in this whole <clears throat> ocean diversity, especially maybe the single cell stuff. But um, so I didn't understand when you go to WA and you have this kind of float half underwater coral areas and then you sequence the genome. Yeah. Do you have one species of coral and then you just do very deep sequencing on that? Or you have 200 species of coral with totally different genomes and you have to oh. sequence deep everything? Oh, that, that's now a great question. species yeah. present on the atolls or do they have totally different species and then you cannot even compare the genomics because they're like different chromosome sizes or hmm. numbers. Uh, so I should have mentioned really all this work is sadly mostly very taxonomically restricted so we're working mostly with the cropper corals and it's just one species for each study so you're absolutely right that that's you can't project to what the whole reef is going to be like um we need to do more studies on certain underrepresented species for sure um there's definitely some big taxonomic groups that are not represented in this type of work and that's absolutely something that needs to be done and if I may just add very quickly, I mean, the question is not whether you spend more or less money on sequencing, right? The question is whether you spend less money on sequencing more types of coral or you spend more money on one type of coral and hope that that's representative for the rest. So I guess yeah. maybe if you could comment on that for one second, that'd be great. Thank you. Well, I think that the only way to, again, I think that you need to, um, well, for this type of research and these type of questions that I've um, looked at in these studies, the only way to do it is one coral at a time. You can't do really do demographic studies on multiple species unless you gather enough data. Um, and, but there's other kinds of studies that we should be doing that are more based on diversity. And, um, and so, you know, that's kind of a different, different set of questions, I think. Please. It's on. Oh, hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the talk. I think this is really um, incredible research. Um, I was really curious if you're also looking at genetic and, and environment interactions. Uh, yeah, so, well, uh, this type of stuff is, is being done. Um, and there's also been, um, I mean, it's a little bit tricky, right? So you, we don't really cultivate these things. We go out and collect them. So the environment is what it is. <laughs> um, and, and so in the traditional way that you might investigate G by E in, in interactions is a little bit limited, but um, there are also studies to do things um, like um, genome-wide association studies and that type of thing. Um, so far, it's actually been very hard 
to turn up um, useful results from those studies. But they are, people haven't given up yet, put it that way. <laughs> and it's just a matter of getting more and more samples and, um, and, and better phenotypic data as well. So um, that's, those are all things that people at AIMS are addressing with um, sort of their research programs. 